All right, so this, oh, I got, I think I still got a little candy left. So, so last week on the, on the first day, you had to answer a question to get a piece of candy, right? And then on the second day, I had to think you had the correct answer to the question. Um, I, th I my intent was to only give candy on the second day to people that I thought had the correct answer. Um, and so today, if you feel like you need a piece of candy, you should come get it because I'm done throwing it. But um, all right, so we're ready to go. What is stress? Yes. Force over area. We have a, we have a vote for force over area. Is that all stress is? So being a student at WPI. <laughs> they have the same units. So yeah, so pressure and stress have the same units. So that, that's interesting. So why is being a student at WPI stress? Because of the pressure. So let's think about this. Where does the pressure come from? This is serious discussion. What's that? Expectations. Who's? Yourself, your teachers. Yourself, your teachers, who else? Your parents. Your parents. Oh, yeah. The people that you might think might care, right? So there's, there's, there's pressure, actually, it's, it, we're like a balloon, right? The pressure is coming, well, no, in a balloon, I guess the pressure is coming from the inside. But, but also it's coming from the outside. It's what makes it not just infinitely get bigger, right? And so in that pressure is really like a force pushing on us when we feel stress, right? And you know, on top of expectations, I was gonna mention like getting to class on time because otherwise you're gonna get dirty looks by everybody in class. Getting to class on time or wanting everybody to look at you so you come in late, right? There's two different thoughts there. But so the stress, this is that pressure. It's, it's, it's the world pushing down on us. And, and if we weren't there, they could push all they want, right? Because there'd be no stress because they're pushing and they're pushing over here and we're over there. So you don't feel that stress, right? It's not stressful when your parents have expectations for what your brother or sister does. It's stressful when your parents have expectations for what you do or when your teachers, whoever it is, right? So it is, I would argue that mental stress and engineering stress, which is, you said it before, force over area are the same thing, right? So when we, when we look at stress, whether we're looking at mental stress, we're looking at physical stress or engineering stress, it really is is the same thing. So we have a um, we have an area. I should get a volunteer again, right? We can apply some stress to them. But when we take something and we push on it with that stress, whether it's mental stress or engineering stress, what happens? What happens when we apply stress? Yeah, things deform. Okay, specifically? If you apply too much stress, it could break. I suppose if you apply too much stress, it could break. So we want to keep from breaking things, right? But when you apply stress, so is all stress bad? No. Right, even, even the mental kind. Sometimes that mental kind, it gets you moving. It gets you to focus and do the things that you want to do. So not all stress is bad. And so when we apply a stress... The thing we apply the stress to changes shape. Yeah. Strain. And we call that strain. And it's the result of stress. Look at these fancy slides, huh? You didn't know I could do fancy slides. I could do fancy slides, sort of. And uh, and so strain is that that measurement of the change in shape. Every time you apply a stress, there will be a strain whether it's mental stress, physical stress, and, uh, and you can measure it. 
look at that. There's an equation. So strain, strain is just the difference in lengths divided by the original length. All right, does that all make sense? Can you leave that slide up for a second? I can. But remember, you don't need to memorize formulas. Just know that they exist and you can go look them up. Yeah. Especially, well, at least in this class. Like in certain like, in certain classes. I just feel like that would be frowned upon in, uh, in my ECE lessons. Which is silly because which ECE well, I mean, engineer ever designed something without having a book that they could use as a reference? You might have a cheat sheet. But, I mean, you can't. <laughs> but it's probably going to sound like I'm going to be ahead, but like there's probably two two types of stress that are going to be called strain, the tension and uh, compression. Um, yeah, you can you can refer to tension and compression. Um, it's really just stress with a positive or negative sign. Mm -hmm. Doesn't doesn't make any difference. You can flip the sign. You should. And in fact, that's that's important when you're doing the math on something like this. If you should, in your mind, sort of know what the right answer is before you plug it into your calculator, so that if you get the opposite sign for what you expected, for example. You know you screwed something up, so you should you should be able to do some of this sort of intuitively. And how do you develop the ability to do stuff intuitively? Practice. And if you're an engineer and you're doing math intuitively and using the results, what do we call it? So there's a term for this. Anybody know? Did you have your hand up? No, taking notes. What do we call it? We call it engineering judgment <clears throat> or scientific wild ass guess. Um, but engineering judgment is what you tell the boss. And uh, and so do you do you guys have engineering judgment? Of course you do. Is it as good as somebody else's? Maybe not. Right. The longer you do it, the more practice you have, the more judgment you have. All right. So anyway, stress. Strain is the change in length. I have envisioned, right? What's stress again? Force over area, right? If we want to reduce stress, because that's a goal, right? Especially mental stress. Force over area, just fix the area part, right? Stress goes down. If anybody needs a piece of candy, I can help you out with that. All right, but what are we going to use this for? In uh, in engineering, we're going to use this. One of the things that we'll do is if you take a material, you apply a known stress to it, you measure the strain, you change the stress, you measure the strain, and the uh, go ahead. I guess a good form of mental stress is like you know you're in a sports competition, you want to run faster than your opponents. Yeah, or you're running away from a bear. Or running away from a bear. Running away from a bear. You know, you don't have to run faster than the bear. Just have to run faster than your friends. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> all right. So if we uh, we can look at our elastic modulus for the material. So, so it's the stress over the sorry, the stress over strain is the elastic modulus and it's specific, it's a bulk property of materials. So what are some other bulk properties we have for materials? And so this is important because it helps us understand how the, the parts are gonna cut, right? So what are some other bulk properties we have for materials? We have elasticity, yep. Malleability. Malleability, I think that's coupled with this elasticity probably. Um, so hardness and, and the way you measure hardness on a material is you take something that's really hard, usually a diamond, and you push it into the material with a known force. And so you have a known stress or, or known stress, known pressure on the thing. And then you take it away and you look at it with a microscope and you see how big of a dent did it make? Right. And so and then there's different scales for measuring those little divots that you put in for different forces. It'll tell you how hard the material is. So if the material is harder, smaller dent. Materials less hard, bigger dent. That makes sense. And so how does hardness impact us when we're doing CNC machining? Yeah. 
requires more force with, with the, the tool? It will put more force on the tool. Yeah. So, were you going to say something? Yeah. <clears throat> Takes more energy to cut. So, because of more energy, more force. Uh, we want the tool to be harder than the workpiece. Does that make sense? If the tool is not harder than the workpiece, can we still machine the workpiece? You can machine the <laughs> well, you you definitely will machine the tool, but you can still remove material from the workpiece. It's just that the tool is going to wear out really fast, right? Maybe faster than you want to. So it is possible, even if the tool is not harder. Um, and so who's ever heard of the term work hardening? Over here. So could you describe it for us? Do you know what it means? How it works? Okay. Yeah. So, so certain certain materials are more susceptible to work hardening than others, but but the whole idea is when you do work on it. So when you apply a force across a distance on the material, like hitting it with a hammer, like cutting it with a cutting tool, um, or the the paperclip thing, right? You take a paperclip and bend it back and forth until it breaks. We've all done this, right? So it broke because of fatigue, but also you work hardened it, which made that fatigue happen faster. And so when you take your cutting tool and you go through the material, if you have a work hardening material like, like many stainless steels, you have now made the layer of material that you left behind harder than the material was when you started cutting. And, but, but not throughout the whole material, just a thin layer. So you you've work hardened it at that surface. There's other there's other processes that'll make the material harder on the surface. So when you work harden it, if you come back, so so you say, all right, I know this is a difficult material to machine. I know that it work hardens, so I'm going to be careful. And so, what's your natural tendency as a as a machine setup person or a machinist when you want to be careful? Slow down. What else? Take a smaller chip, right? Don't feed in as far. And if you have a work hardening material and you take that approach, you wear out the, the tool very quickly because you've made the material harder by cutting it. Your next cut needs to be deeper than the layer that you just made harder. And then, yeah, you've got some hard material at the top but you're cutting mostly through that easier to cut material. Um, it'll, it'll do some weird things with the tool wear. All right, anyway, so that's, that's hardness. When we're looking at elasticity now, how is this gonna affect us in CNC machining? What are, what are the things that are gonna happen with elasticity that are gonna affect us with CNC machining? Yeah, let me uh, send one of these screens away. Right screen up. Right projector mute. Okay, so <laughs> found some candy on the chalkboard. Okay, so if we're taking a really small chip, you said, and so you want to do a turning operation or a milling operation? Either one. Um, so let's do the turning because it's just e a little bit easier to draw. And we know there's some surface roughness there, but I'm not going to bother to draw that.
So here's our, our workpiece. If we're taking a really small chip, and so we could take a really small chip by doing small depth of cut. We could take a really small chip by reducing our feed rate, right? So the first way we wanted to be conservative was to slow down. And so slowing down would be reducing the feed rate, which means our uncut chip thickness is really small. Now, just before the workpiece material gets over here, it was over here, right? So we just made this workpiece material in the last pass. So you would think if it's a work hardening material, it's going to be hard right here. And so if we take a really small feed into it, then you said it might deflect the tool. So because we're, we're putting pressure on the tool, right? Everything we put pressure on will see strain. So it will deflect the tool. And so if the tool deflects, but the machine tool keeps feeding, what's the next thing that's going to happen? Oh, yeah, so let's, for the, yeah, that's more, depends how big the workpiece is. With the workpieces we tend to deal with here at WPI, it's more likely that it pushes the workpiece out of the way. And as soon as you bend it just a little bit, the next time it comes around, it smacks the tool holder. It makes really obnoxious, loud noises. And, uh, and you'll hear inside the machine, well, um, just let's just say that if you're operating the lathe and it sounds like a helicopter suddenly, just press the e-stop. Something's wrong. Oh. Um, if it sounds, you know, whether it's whether it's like a, a drone sounding helicopter or like the 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 old war movie helicopter flying oh. in to pick up the troops kind of helicopter. If it sounds like that, something's wrong oh. unless you meant to do it. So is it supposed to sound like a jet engine? It should be more smooth. Uh, what, what makes it sound like a helicopter is that interrupted cut. Oh. And so if you're on purpose cutting something where you know you're going to have an interrupted cut, you'll expect that sound. But in general, you're not. But let's just assume that the workpiece is rigid enough to handle it, which can, can also be the case. So if we're, we're pushing here, <clears throat> so we've got thousands of pounds of thrust available and the servo motors to push this along with the gear reductions and all that in the, in the screws. So we've got a lot of force we can push on it with. If we're not making a chip because we've pushed the tool back because the work, the surface is too hard. We keep pushing though, don't we? Right. And so then our tool becomes a spring. And, and so that also wants to push back, right? That also eventually you'll get, well, eventually one of two things are going to happen. You're going to move the workpiece either in the spindle or sideways, and then it's going to smash and do all that loud noise stuff. Um, or you will stall the workpiece in the spindle, which means the spindle keeps going, but the workpiece stops rotating. Um, this usually results in welding the workpiece to the jaws of the chuck uh, eventually, and then, then bad things happen. Um, all right, so if we're doing this, but in a lot of cases, what will happen is eventually there'll be enough force and it'll jump forward because it's the, the tool has moved. You get the spring loading up. Eventually it overcomes that and it jumps forward and it makes a chip. And then it repeats that cycle because we're still only feeding how far we're, fast we're feeding. And you set up this dynamic chatter that's happening because you're doing that. And it sounds uh, like a, like like the screech, not quite like the chalkboard screech with the fingernails, but it sounds really bad. You'll, you'll know it when you hear it. Um, and so when you get that kind of a chatter going on, it puts more vibrations in the, uh, in the spindle. It actually wears out the bearings for the spindle faster. So if you do this often, 
you'll replace the, the spindle or the spindle bearings more often. Um, the other thing it does is it beats the hell out of the tool. I mean, so the tool fails quickly when you put it in a situation like this. Whereas if, instead of slowing down, you just went the normal feed that you were supposed to go, you would wear the tool a little bit because you're, you're initially getting past that hard material. But since we're doing like a spiral as we go around here, um, where you are gonna wear the tool is more here on the tip because you've also made this surface hard, right? You made this surface up here hard and this surface here hard. And so having too little feed rate is gonna be a problem. So you wanna feed with the feed that is recommended for the tool. Does that make sense in our turning thing? So how else does elasticity impact us? Because that wasn't the answer I was thinking of, but it was a really good tangent to go down. How else does this elasticity impact us? We sort of touched on it, right? So we've got cutting force. So in this situation, what direction does the cutting force go? So some of it, so remember, if we look at our cutting force diagram, we're looking down here. At any rate, it's, it's th this resultant force is somehow like this maybe, right? So some component could be in and out of the board and some component could be this way. Yep. Isn't it also gonna go like into a base and upwards in the base? Um, well, if, if we're rotating, I imagine we were rotating clockwise here. So the workpiece is coming down like this. The workpiece is trying to push the tool into the board. The tool's pushing the workpiece up this way, sort of, right? So we, we see that. And so when we push on the workpiece, of course, the workpiece deflects. So if we have a material with a lower Young's modulus or elastic modulus, we have a lower modulus there, we're more likely to defect, deflect the material. That makes sense? Right, because we did our deflection equation the other day. What was it again? So deflection, anybody remember what it equals? Anybody quickly look it up? Somebody that took stress, remember what it is? Right, we had length up here. We had force up here. We had our moment, area moment of inertia here. And we had our elastic modulus, right? And this one is cubed. And I mean, for a round thing, I is gonna have a, a radius that's to the fourth power, I think, somewhere. We'd look that up in a table, right? So we're gonna deflect our part based on that equation as we go. And so we remember that that's gonna make a, a finished piece that looks more like this, right? It's gonna be wider at the end than it is near the chuck where we're holding it. So what are some things we could do to minimize this happening, right? Because we, we know it will happen to some degree, right? We will have deflection, it's gonna happen. What are some things we could do to minimize that? If I, want to, if I want to make that part, let's think through what we know about CNC machining. What could we do? What are the things we get to choose? Yep. I'm trying to minimize the length of your saw. All right, so the first thing is choke up on the bat, right? Minimize overhang. And so we can minimize overhang both of the workpiece material and the tool, right? Yeah. Is it possible to take a smaller tip at the beginning and then get one bigger one? So we could have an adaptive tool path, right? So if we know, well, actually, we do know that this diameter is going to change based on this equation, right? So we could actually work out in advance 
or by trial and error, right? You could cut the first one without doing anything special and see how much it changed over the length. And then from that, you could figure out the rate that you need to change your tool path. And instead of having the tool come in with a tool path that's straight, you could have the tool path come in, I don't know, it's gonna be something like that. It, it won't be a straight line because of the cube, right? But it'll, it'll have to be more and then less. And then when it's finished, the part could be straight. So you could definitely do that. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody do that in production, but mathematically it has to work, right? Um, all right, so that's that's one thing you could do. What else could we, so we'll call that fancy toolpath. We do a fancy toolpath. Is there anything else we can do? Who's ever used a manual lathe here? So, what, what's the first thing you do to reduce deflection of your workpiece? Forgot. You forgot? You know? Um, well, you want to just make sure you're not crashing, but yeah, not that. So, well, you want to make sure it's in the center at most, also. But uh, many lathes, not all, but many lathes. So we're holding it with our chuck over here, right? Whether it's a three jaw chuck or a collet chuck or whatever it is, we could hold it by something at this end also. And so we have a thing in a lathe called a tailstock and a um, couple of our CNC lathes have tailstocks, the other ones don't. And, and the reason they don't isn't because they're bad. It's because some of the lathes are kind of small and it gets really crowded when you put more stuff inside the box. Um, so we've got two that don't, two that do. Uh, but you can have this other thing that comes over. And usually what you do is you drill what's called a center hole over here with a center drill. Who's ever used a center drill? So if you actually used a center drill and not a spot drill. It's got the, this weird shape on the end. Looks like that, right? And so it's got the cutting flutes on it. So that's a center drill, the one that looks like that. So the purpose for center drills is to make these holes so that we can take our pointed centering tailstock and push it in there. And we'd like this to be held on something that can spin, right? So we put that in bearings and stuff like that. You push it in there with some force and now you're supporting this piece at both ends. So instead of getting a part that's bigger at one end, you'll get a part that's bigger in the middle. And it'll be like, I don't know, something less than half as bigger at the most big part, right? So you can support the other end. Changes the equation for how the math happens. You could even use a follower and you could support it on the opposite side of where the tool is with a spring-loaded bearing that pushes back on it right where you're cutting. And so there's different ways to eliminate that deflection. Each one of those steps takes more time to set up, right? What if we just wanted to change the tool path and we wanted to have less deflection? Yep. And not, not the fancy one that calculates the equation. So one thing we can do to get less deflection is reduce the depth of cut, right? So we could take off less. Or we could take off less. It would still deflect with the same pattern, but force would be lower. So we can reduce the force by reducing the depth of cut. 
if we're not worried about work hardening, we can reduce the force by reducing the feed rate, right? So we can reduce that volumetric chip removal rate to, to do that. Um, but even doing this, what happens is as you do multiple passes, right? That's one of the reasons we'll do multiple passes is to keep the force down. So as you do multiple passes and you come in, eventually you're gonna get deflection way out here if it's far away from where it's supported. It's, it's just gonna happen. So another thing you could do, instead of having multiple passes that go this way to just make the force lower, So here's our stock material. Here's the shape we want at the end. I don't know why exactly we would want that shape when we're done, but that's the shape we want. And you could imagine this, right? Maybe there's another operation later that's gonna do a cutoff here and we're just trying to make little pins that are a certain diameter. So instead of taking multiple passes across like this, you could take a pass here. And so, yes, you will still get some deflection. As you get closer to the center, you're going to actually have um, more deflection as you get there but you won't be having that force all the way along. And now you've got all of this material still supporting the finished part. And you're only cutting next to where that support is. So you could do a tool path that pecks away at it, basically, to remove that material. Yeah. And, uh, according to the formula, uh, the flexion uh, is uh, force times length cubed by the line. I think I didn't look it up, but I believe that's the equation. Yeah, I mean, but, I know um, it's got those terms in it. Yeah, but I was gonna say, like, if you want to reduce the flexion, I would say, like, reduce that L or like increase the right. And that's why that so reducing the L is stick out as little as possible, yeah. and and this is effectively doing that for the finished diameter by having a big diameter next to it. Because the when it's the big diameter, it won't deflect as much. As the diameter gets smaller, it's going to deflect more. Could you increase the last modulus by heating up the material? Can I like this? I th I think there's got to be cases where you could change the modulus. You can heat treat the material either before or after the, the cutting. Absolutely, people do that all the time for hardness. You'd like to anneal it so cut it in a less hard state and then harden it by doing a heat treating process. Um, typically after that, though, it changes shape during the heat treating process. So then you go back with a grinding operation to make it be the right shape again. Something like that. There's different ways to, uh, to do that stuff. All right, so you can have some fancy tool paths to fix this. Now, how else, oh, how else is this elastic modulus going to screw with us when we're doing our CNC machining. Because it does. If we didn't have to worry about it, life would be easier. Uh, won't you keep changing? The elastic modulus? Yeah. Or, or, um, the eye I mean, changes when you change the diameter of the part. But the elastic modulus is usually consistent through, through the bulk material. It's different from material to material. How else is that going to screw with us? Yeah. You mentioned before aluminum can be harder to um, do than steel because it's elastic modulus is higher, like it, it will deform more easily. So the aluminum could deform more easily. And so, or, I mean, let's just, let's just go all the way to the end. But if you want to cut it out of plastic, what if you're cutting a Teflon part? What's that? So that when you are cutting plastic, how much heat you put into the part is definitely important because putting in too much heat will melt the material. Um, but if you're in that 
that dynamic range where you can machine it and you're not melting it. I mean, you can certainly melt the aluminum too. Has anybody seen that in lab? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, if you've, who, who, who here forgot to, to, or forgot to, didn't know they needed to adjust the coolant for their part? Anybody in this, in this group yet? And did the uh, tool broke? And the, the part that broke off was welded to the part, still stuck in there. So you can, you can definitely do that, a, a, a professor. So it's, it's actually a manufacturing process called stir welding and stir processing. And, uh, and so the way this works is you take a, uh, it looks sort of like an end mill, but it doesn't have any cutting flutes on it. And you spin it and you use a machine tool to just jam it into the material and sort of mush it through the material. So you see, so you got two plates, you want to weld them together. So you can take it, you can clamp them so that they're together and you can sort of mush this tool in between them. And it's called stir welding and they're welded together. It's actually sometimes better than doing a heat welding process um, for the me mechanical properties of the weld. Uh, and a professor wanted to do some research on that. He came in the lab, he says, he said, uh, can we do stir processing here at WPI? Like, do we have the capability, the physical capability? I just laughed. I said, we do it every day on accident. <laughs> and it's when people don't point the coolant or when spin the tool the wrong way, spin the spindle the wrong way, all kinds of ways that we can cause stir processing to happen on accident. Uh, but that's not the focus here. Focus is elastic modulus. And so that is one of the problems. But yeah. Okay, go. Okay, when the chip doesn't break, it's a pain, especially in the lathe, because it wraps around the part and it spins, and it is just so tempting to grab it and pull it out of the way. Don't do that ever. You will lose, if you're lucky, just your hand, but more likely your arm or yourself. So don't ever try to pull the chip off. Uh, even after you stop the lathe, use a tool to remove the chip if it's stuck on there, because they are razor sharp. Um, okay, so chip not breaking is bad. We did have a student that um, was too lazy to cut the bar stock before putting it in the lathe. So he thought it'd be okay if it hung out in the back of the lathe. So you just slide it in. And, and this is a thing. It's a thing that that people do in industry. It's a normal thing to have the material hang out the back of the lathe. Now, when they do it on purpose in industry, it's not because they were too damn lazy um, and they have stuff out there to hold it and to allow it to rotate without flopping around. We actually made him a t-shirt um, and we made him wear the t-shirt and uh, his name was Mark Sue. So it was Mark, he who breaks the building. Because that piece was sticking out about three and a half feet out of the back of the lathe. And his, I broke this email. So, you know, if you break something, you write an email, I broke this, wpi.edu. Say what you were doing. What was the result? Please include pictures. What's the approximate cost to WPI for your mistake? And what are you going to do next time to make sure it doesn't happen again? And so his email was very classic. It was, as soon as I realized what the wump wump noise was, <laughs> I hit the e-stop. And the wump wump noise was exactly what you're talking about. It was, as soon as it started spinning a little bit unbalanced, it was unbalanced because of gravity. As soon as it started spinning a little bit unbalanced, it started spinning more and more unbalanced. And there was one of those posts that holds up the building, the columns in there. You know, those are wood columns in there holds up the building. It's a wood frame building. So anyway, it, the lathe was near one of those and the wump wump noise was it taking a bite out of one of those columns, <laughs> right? So yeah, that's, that's a problem. But this case, it was just lazy was the problem. And, and actually it, it, we laugh about it and we can laugh about it because nobody died. But if somebody had been walking by at that moment, they could have died, right? So we can laugh about it because nothing really bad happened. But it's, it's one of those things to think about. Um, but yeah, so that's a thing. The other thing is, let's, um, all right, so let's, 
it can be in the lathe, it can be in the mill, doesn't matter. But let's just think about our milling operation. Let's say we have a piece of plastic and it's prismatic, it's, rectang it's a rectangular prism. So it's just like a shoebox kind of shape. So we've got our, there's a lot of really small pieces of chalk and I, uh, oh, there's my big one. There was only one full length piece of chalk. So let's say this is our workpiece material. So top view, maybe side view over here. And let's say, I don't know, this is a half an inch tall maybe. And if that's a half an inch, then this is maybe two inches, we'll call it. Uh, let's say not to scale. In case anybody's going to try to measure this off the, the camera view, maybe two by two inches. All right, and we want to put... Let's say we want to put a hole through it. And this diameter uh, is two by two. Let's make this diameter one inch. No, 0.75. Okay, so we want to do that. And um, what's our workpiece material? Aluminum, you guys want to make it out of aluminum? Gold, all right, gold. We'd, if it was gold, we would make sure that we were collecting all the chips. Uh, but other than that, people machine gold. That's one of, the, one of the ways that we make jewelry is doing machining in gold. All right, um, really doesn't matter what the workpiece material is for the sake of the example. But how do we fixture this then? If this is our workpiece and we want to we want to drill a hole in it, let's say we're gonna we're gonna use a little end mill and we're gonna make a pocket that makes that hole. So our, our process is we're gonna make use an end mill and make a pocket. How do we fixture this? Yep. Why? It it it's stainless steel. It's A6 tool steel. It doesn't matter what the material is. What, so, so don't assume that you need something special first. Um, if we fixture it in a vise, it was just, if it was aluminum, you'd put it in a vise? Yeah, okay. And so when we put it in a vise, we've got our vise jaws, right? And we've got our workpiece in here. Maybe we'll put it up above the top of the vise jaws. We've got our workpiece here. Now let's put it even with the top of the workpiece, the vice jaws. We're only making a hole in it, right? It could be down inside the vice jaws. It, it's more complicated if we let it stick out. So we'll put it even with the top of the vice jaws. We've got it sitting on our parallels. We've all done this in lab now. We clamp our part in there and we crank down with our torque wrench or with whatever tool that we're using to close the vice. And So if, if we're doing our pocketing operation and we're pocketing this out, some of the cutting force is going to be trying to push it this way. Some of the cutting force is going to be trying to push it that way. It depends on where we are in the, in the rotation of the tool, right? But a significant component of the cutting force is going to be trying to pull the part out of the vise. So there's going to be cutting force in all three directions, but a significant part of it is going to go that direction. Besides gravity, because if the part's heavy enough, you can just use gravity for this, but our part's not heavy enough. Besides gravity, what keeps the part from flying up out of the machine? The friction against the jaws of the vise. The friction against the jaws of the vise, right? If we've got downward cutting force, if we're doing like a drilling operation, we'd have some downward cutting force. And then it would be the, you know, the parallels and stuff would hold it up too, not just the friction. But the only thing that keeps it from flying up is the friction on the clamping surface there. All right. So now let's, 
so how do you get more friction or how much friction do we need we need enough to overcome the cutting force right the amount that could be the cutting force depending on our operation could be pounds of force hundreds of pounds of force thousands of pounds of force could be in that range anywhere from almost no force to thousands of pounds when we want to reduce the cutting force we take a smaller tool smaller path and smaller steps that makes sense right so as we're doing this if the part is has the tendency to move up what do we do to fix it clamp harder right we increase the normal force because we just have um normal force times mu is our friction force that's keeping it from flying up right so when we clamp harder well we've applied a we've applied a stress right we've put a stress on it there will be strain so when it's clamped over here it's actually not two inches wide it's something less than two inches wide when we squeeze it but our tool path is still going to make a round hole when we let go of it it's going to be like my stress relief right the the, the hole's going to get bigger it's going to get wider in one direction and so you can actually calculate how much that is If you know the elastic modulus and the um, the uh, the stress, so how much pressure you've put on it, and so this would be if you were clamping something in a vise, it's going to get bigger when you let go of it. This is the other way that this elastic modulus screws with us as um, as users of the machine. Let's. Um, Same, same thing with clamping force in the lathe, right? So cutting force in the lathe is going to try to, it's going to try to bend the workpiece. We already saw, showed that, right, with our deflection equation. It's also going to try to push it into the spindle if the cutting force is that direction. I suppose if you set up your operation just right, you could try to pull the part out of the spindle with your cutting force too, right? And so it's friction between the chuck jaws in the workpiece that keeps it from going into or out of the spindle and that cause it to rotate, right? Because some of that cutting force is trying to stop it from rotating. And so if you're doing that, <coughs> the other thing you have to worry about is, as, and we, we did a picture of this a couple weeks ago on the board, I think, as you're spinning that lathe faster and faster, the jaws want to accelerate away from the center more and more. And so your effective clamping force gets reduced by that, those jaws trying to fly out of the lathe. Um, so these are ways that stress and strain impact us um, in CNC machining. So I promised you that I was going to do an assignment where you could do some modeling. And so I'm going to post that later today. And you'll have, what, what week is it now? How many more weeks of school do we have? Like four, I think it's like four more weeks of school, something like that, three and a half, 24 days. So let's have this not be due at the very end of the term. Um, I would encourage you to work together with your group when you work on it, um, but maybe I'll just tell you to work together with your group. Each group will do it and have one submission for the group. How's that? We made it a group assignment just now. And, uh, and so what you're gonna do, the first step is gonna be to build a, a set of models using either Excel or slides or, or, or Google Sheets or whatever, whatever spreadsheet program that you have access to. Somebody did it once using MathCAD, I think. So I, I did say I don't care what software you use, and I really don't. <clears throat> but build a, a, this model that can answer these kind of questions. 
and work through to make sure that you've got the correct answers for the questions. And then you can use that model when we do in the last week when we do our little final exam. And I'll, so I'll give you, um, I've got actually a, a presentation that just has slides with equations on it. And it's all the equations that we use in this class, including some that we haven't come to yet, but there aren't that many that we haven't gotten to yet. So I'm gonna give you that presentation, some instructions and a video that steps you through how that model should work. It is key, I think, to have a picture of the slide with the equation on the page where you're doing the math so that when you're doing it, you'll remember that this is the thing for that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that was that. So thank you very much for your attention.